the representation from uh, different uh, uh, governmental agencies, ministries, uh, private organizations, social partners, civil society organizations from Europe and from um, neighboring countries. Some are operating in international um, uh, environment, some others working at national level or even at local level. So thank you very much. This, I think, it's the uh, best way to discuss governance today because um, the way ETF understands governance is about um, a multi-actor and multi-level approach. So that's what we try to see here today represented. I think it's a good environment to start discussing about that. And in particular in education and, and training, and even if uh, in the approach that DTF is supporting of a lifelong learning approach, this uh, multi-level and multi-actor approach is even more important, more in essential. In fact, uh, this area, this policy area of uh, lifelong learning is um, a complex system that there, were, uh, there is a convergence, convergence of different policy areas from economic development, enterprise uh, competitiveness, social fairness, cohesion, education. So it's it's uh, different areas are all finding themselves all together here. And there are, of course, many actors that uh, from state to non-state actors uh, who have a stake in vocational skills and then for employment and lifelong learning and more broadly. So the advantage of uh, multi-actor and multi-level approaches in governance is that they, they are better posed to linking the objectives of policy with the actual implementation and delivery of policy. And uh, in, this is uh, an essential way of finding uh, this, the implementation of these policies more efficient. So the VET uh, governance uh, toolkit has been designed by ETF as to support a participatory approach to governance based on these considerations and the consultation of all actors involved, and the sharing of uh, responsibilities and the coordination of actions in vocational education and training and in lifelong learning functions better work uh, if they are um, organizing this way rather than if they are centralized uh, in a uh, rigid and vertical approach. Uh, but um, the second thing is that despite the, these uh, approaches, I, we think that they are uh, make uh, more efficiently implementation of uh, VET policy. We always find in much of the countries that the VET and in lifelong learning are in um, in um, in reform in many countries. So we also think that uh, this uh, webinar today, the objective is that we always want to show that this governance arrangement need to improve also when there is a, we are in a reform environment. Um, like that, we can address the, the question of uh, if governance arrangements are fit to pull for purpose when those forms are taking place. If we are changing a system, the governance arrangements should change too. So let's put the two examples. One is the, the COVID crisis that we are just uh, still in. Uh, we've seen that the, the, the places where they've been managed better the situation is where um, they have uh, better resilience. And there is where uh, there's better arrangements between the different actors. Yeah? Um, an example is if a uh, school was already working with uh, different uh, other organizations in the territory with uh, some companies and with the local authorities and even some international projects, in the moment where the school was closed, there was better ways of finding solutions to bring the distance learning to their students. If the school was isolated, was not working with anyone, was just, just working perhaps very well inside, at the moment that the school was closed, it was very difficult for them to start uh, producing this, uh, this uh, uh, other means for their students. Similar, it happens with a company. We've seen the companies that were closed because there was no supplies for the companies, but the companies were very well connected with the local authorities. They were very well connected with the, the, the hospitals in the, in the territory and so on. So they started to change their production and they started to produce some breathing machines or some uh, masks or whatever. 
So they easily reacted to this situation because they were already embedded in an ecosystem of relationships with other actors. So if, uh, if we want to, if uh, this COVID crisis shows that uh, uh, they have to be, we have to be more agile, uh, also this multi-level governance uh, arrangement have to go in this direction right? and uh, how the decision-making can improve to be more flexible and more inclusive how the partnership between public and private uh, uh, actors can be uh, more responsive, more smart. So these are uh, issues that we see that in a change of, of policy situation, we need also to review the, the government uh, governance. Uh, rate. Another example is now last week or two weeks ago, there was the, the new declaration of the, the of this uh, Copenhagen process, the so-called now Osnabrück uh, Declaration. We see that there are different uh, priorities uh, in order to new targets to have a more accessible, equitable, and high quality learning opportunity for all. Okay, this means that uh, probably, if not the priority goes more in reskilling and upskilling uh, uh, people who perhaps are not young people, but adults working in in, in already in, in the employment, uh, probably the, the governance arrangements that were uh, more useful to make uh, schools more accessible and attractive are not the same as those that we are now with this new policy arrangement. Uh, Simone, I'm finishing. Uh, hey, so the the toolkit so is composed of seven areas and uh, they will be presented today, which go from how to develop a vision how to develop uh, institu institutional arrangements, financement, uh, partnership, uh, territorial um, uh, governance, and so on. So we want to show today uh, how the content of this uh, toolkit and how it can be used. And uh, we will have an overview, but uh, in the future, we can go um, a little bit more specific focus on some of the areas of the toolkit. So I stop here. Uh, we look forward to for your feedback and I wish you a very good webinar. Back to you, Simona. Super, thanks, Xavier. Special thanks actually goes to Xavier because we know that today is jumping from one meeting to the other. So thank you so much for taking the time for being with us. It has been a privilege. It's December, and a pleasure. it's December. <laughs> it's December, it's Christmas time, although it doesn't look like, at least in Italy. So, okay. Allora, having said that, who is here today with you and why we are here today? So to reply to these two questions, the ETF team today is actually me, who are just the entertainer, basically. Then the real people around the table for you today is Miss Cecilia Taurelli, who is actually, allow me to call her a pillar of governance and lifelong learning in ETF, an historical expert. Together with Madame Cecilia, we have Jose Manuel Galvin, although Manuel, I'm sorry, I don't remember the full last name, so Manuel, to make it short, who is actually our responsible person for methodologies and analytical framework when it comes to governance, and actually, again, another historical expert, and together with Syria, they're really those who take the lead in the ETF cooperation with all the international organization and international panorama on governance. But the, the story doesn't end here. We also have Erica that you don't see now, but you will see later, unless you want to switch on the camera. And actually, she's the deus ex machina, which means that nothing of this would happen without her. We also have Anna, who is our event designer. And actually, she will help us in all the streaming, technical production. So we have these two wonderful people, which makes the engine going on. I'm trying to speak a bit quickly, and I'm sorry, although I usually speak very quickly as Italian, just because I want to stick to the time we are planned. So the agenda of the day, we are here to discuss vet governance in action. We actually will have an introduction on the vet governance toolkit, which will be made by Syria. Then we will have, of course, a space for question and answers, conversation and input. That will be your time for being with us and talking to us. And then we will have a Two, two breakout rooms, which means two working groups where actually we will talk more in depth about certain topics, which I will announce later in the day, not now yet. And so we'll have a kind of discussion on next steps and conclusion. So 
Having said that, I think that without any indulgence, I would like to ask you all to look at the chat. You have a, in the chat, you have a link for Mentimeter. Go in the chat. You see there is a button just next to participants and click on the link. You will be redirected to a tool where we would like to ask you a couple of questions, which will be essential for us in order to also build upon live, basically, also the presentation and the discussion we want to have today with you. Uh, can I assume, since now we are screen sharing, that most of you are already in the link and you are already see this guy moving a lot and telling you you are all ready for this i guess so uh, just a plea for me as entertainer of the day uh, if you can keep your camera on if uh, your environment allow for it it would be very pleasant for me okay so i think we can launch the first question and when I, I think I can launch the first question, I'm referring to actually Erika. Uh, we see the number. So we see that for the moment, only seven people replied. I tell you again, go in the chat, click on the link you will find on the chat in Mentimeter. You will be redirected and then just reply. It's very important for us to understand how would you describe the governance of that in your country? Because it's just to have an idea, a flavor of what is the situation around us because we might have a different perception. So I think I would leave uh, few more seconds, the more replies and the better it is in the sense that then we are able to really taste what is around. At mm -hmm. least the good news is that a few are replying, but we have zero under I don't know. So at least those who are replying are at least aware <laughs> of how governance of that is dealing in the country. Let's go. You see, it's very quick. Let's go <laughs> to the second well. question. What does that governance involve? Please use one word. We see that the words are coming out straight away are coordination, cooperation, prioritization, shared responsibility. You know that the more bright the same word and the more basically the word become bigger. So most of you, I'm sure, knows the word cloud philosophy. So I would actually leave just the three, four seconds more. I think that cooperation and coordination are actually the winners of the day. So talking about coordination and cooperation, and also want to introduce a new, comp, a new concept, the competition, coordination and competition, which some, sometimes can help productivity. I think that without any indulgence, I can pass the floor to Syria. And now actually we go to the gritty nitty part of our days together. Syria, the floor is yours. Thank you to everyone. Thank you and uh, good morning again or good afternoon, depending where you are. Uh, actually, I'm very happy to start from uh, cooperation and coordination. And I will guide you through um, the um, uh, next slide. I will guide you through actually what do we mean by uh, governance in vocational education and training on the base of both uh, some theoretical approach, but very much also based on the practice and experience of the ETF uh, work in vocational education and training and lifelong learning. And the first thing that I would like to highlight uh, is actually that uh, uh, nowadays uh, the definitions of governance, which is the activity of governing, uh, highlight a wide range of factors and stakeholders. We can say of factors and actors. So this is about the institutions, but also the processes and traditions that interact. And we can observe a multiplicity of actors that play a role in the governance. So this is a um, move away from more traditional definitions, which instead used to attribute almost uh, exclusive role to the state. So the governance was the business of the government and it referred to laws, uh, administrative rules, uh, judicial rulings uh, and practices that either constrain or enable the activities of the government. So here we, um, we are actually talking about a wider range of factors. And in this slide, 
um, we can see two uh, relevant definitions of uh, multi-level governance. Xavier in his introduction uh, uh, explained that ETF refers and applies the concept and approach of multi-level governance, which under the broad definition of, uh, of governance actually um, um, explains that uh, uh, multi-level governance is about making decisions. This is a uh, um, an exercise in power. This is normal in terms of governance, but the important part is that these decisions are binding for a multiplicity of actors. And these actors are in a state of interdependence um, one with another. They are public, they are private, they are uh, located or they operate at different levels of territorial aggregation. They can be and they are most often politically independent but in terms of the system they operate uh, within and in our case uh, this is a vocational education and training they are interdependent so when they make a decision actually this affects other parts of the system um, and the other definition on the right hand of the screen by oliver which is all equally relevant talks uh, again, about the fact that go multi-level governance is about how the power is exercised and decisions are taken, but uh, in a similar way to the previous definition, it really highlights uh, the issue of the interactions among the institutions and processes. So it's not only as it used to be about the uh, power and decision within the governmental institutions, but there's a lot about the processes that uh, engage a number of different actors. Um, and uh, you see that in both definitions, is highlighted in green, uh, there is a reference, very interesting, to um, processes and also mechanisms. Um, they are negotiation, they are deliberations, and the way uh, a policy is actually implemented, but it is also about how the stakeholders, including the citizens, have their say. So we have uh, uh, the actors, we have the processes, and we um, have to pay very much attention about the, the how. And this also means that for how things and policies are implemented, we need mechanism. This is important because uh, we will come back to that uh, uh, also in terms of the uh, vet governance uh, toolkit of the ETF. So we take the initial definition and we try to apply in uh, vocational education and training. This is a work done by the ETF, but also obviously based and inspired uh, uh, by the um, Committee of the Region of the European Union, as well as SEDEFOP. But the work of uh, and the development of the team uh, of experts uh, in ETF, I really try to focus on what does multi-level governance mean for vocational education and training, in particular, if we refer to the third countries, neighboring countries uh, um, that surround the European Union. So we like to define, or we have uh, tested in practice and learned from experience that multi-level governance um, um, in VET is about making policy um, on the basis of coordinated action and shared responsibility among various public and private stakeholders at all levels from international down to regional and local uh, and local level and also this is a, an important element at all stages of the of the policy cycle Therefore, this coordinated action and contribution and participation, as Xavier put it at the beginning, it happens uh, from the objective setting, from the strategic development, say the agenda setting of the VET policy, down to implementation with the monitoring, because we do monitor uh, while uh, policies are implemented, and uh, eventually at the stage of reviewing assessing, uh, uh, evaluating the effectiveness uh, of the VET uh, policy. So uh, then we see that there is a, uh, also an important uh, addition here about the good governance. So while we ensure that uh, actors are involved uh, and the uh, 
uh, the stakeholders have their say at that level, uh, depending on their level of responsibility. We also take care that uh, uh, the governance ensures the relevance of the policy, the accountability uh, of those who are responsible, the transparency of the decision process and uh, um, on the way the, the institutional arrangement and cooperation mechanism are defined. So let's not forget about uh, um, not only the technicalities, but about the policy objectives and the say environment of the governance that uh, we aim to be a good, uh, a good governance. Um, okay, so after this uh, short intro introduction, uh, what does ETF do in terms of multi-level governance in VET? And uh, we shall become used to expanding into uh, lifelong learning more, more generally, because this is the uh, clear priority and policy of, of the European Union. Uh, we distinguish two main stages, if you like, two uh, moment, although they are um, they, they support each other, they are complementary. The first one is uh, the stage of an analysis where we map the existing arrangement in the governance. Mm -hmm. So who are the actors? Who is involved in the skills related policies? And who should have a say mm, in the policy making? from the agenda setting through to the implementation down to the review and assessment. So who are the actors? Uh, how do they interact? How do they communicate to each other, if you like? Uh, this is, I want to underline the communication among actors and institutions because uh, uh, based on uh, uh, ETF analysis from Torino process to other thematic specific analysis, we um, very much uh, uh, observe and take stock, stock and note uh, uh, that communication and fluidity of uh, um, cooperation uh, among the different uh, parts of the system uh, is something that is often uh, missing. So the first um, area of intervention, if you like, or the first uh, stage is really to analyze, to map, to take stock, stock and uh, assess how the government's arrangements are effectively functioning. But the second one, uh, I wouldn't say the most important, but absolutely very important, is uh, uh, how to move to new arrangements. We are talking about uh, a real change uh, process. The, the question is, um, um, if in a country, if in my country, there is a reform of VET, or there is a um, goal to move from vocational education and training as a somehow isolated policy onto a much more integrated uh, lifelong learning approach, the question is, is the governance as it is now fit for purpose? Uh, if the system change, and if I want to change the system, I need to change the governance too. Um, because uh, arrangement uh, or way institutions cooperate together uh, may function in a given system, they may become obsolete or inefficient uh, into a new uh, context, a situation. What's really important here is uh, always to avoid any supply driven blueprint. Uh, we have again learned from practice that uh, the approach uh, in governance to adapt, to improve the governance is policy learning. It's never, uh, it's never copy paste. Next slide, please. Okay, having that said, um, the, um, I want to show you just uh, one or maybe two of these indicators, we are not going into details now, but uh, um, governance can and should change. It's difficult because it is about uh, how institutions operate, but it is possible. And ETF uses a number of indicators, but uh, say there are three uh, broad and general indicators we use in order to uh, monitor the progress in terms of uh, development uh, in uh, governance of that systems. And the number one is about uh, uh, the vision. So the question of this indicator of the indicators point to the fact whether the 
um, vision of that, vision of the sector, vision of the policy, it's an holistic one. And if this vision is shared by the different actors, the public um, governmental agencies, the non-governmental actors, the social partners. So it's very important to understand whether there is a, um, an agreement and a consensus and a common understanding. And here we can say that from 2017, which are the, uh, say, horizontal data, where we had, uh, uh, say, 36% um, level two, if we, uh, level one is uh, low level, level four is high level, uh, we had, uh, 36% of the uh, 24 countries uh, uh, at intermediate level of, say, sharing and consensus and agreement about uh, the national policy goals. Whereas in 2020, we have uh, a majority of the countries, namely uh, 17 out of 24, we have measured uh, at level three. So the uh, it is possible to work on the sharing, on the consensus, on the uh, agreeing on what are the priorities, what are the strategic objectives, basically, basically, if there is an investment and if there is a commitment to, uh, to do that. So indicator number one. Indicator number two, um, I'm not going to spend much time on it, but it's about the so-called horizontal uh, coordination. So this is about uh, the mechanism whereby actors coordinate at each tier or each level of the governance. So how does it work that, uh, for example, uh, government social partners uh, uh, have an effective dialogue at national level about uh, vocational education skills uh, and about lifelong learning? And what about uh, their cooperation at subnational level? So again, uh, we see uh, an improvement if we read uh, the table horizontally and vertically from 2017 to uh, 2020. Uh, I think uh, now I will ask uh, uh, to my, the help of my colleague to move on to the, um, uh, to the actual uh, um, toolkit, um, because I think we stop now sharing uh, slides and we rather move to the to the tool the tool is located in the open space of the etf um, by now most of you have already registered and entered this is a space uh, at the moment uh, uh, comprising uh, around 2500 uh, members uh, which collects and presents uh, in an interactive way the thematic areas and knowledge areas of, of the etf and one is um, uh, one is governance. In the page uh, of governance, you find the VET governance toolkit, uh, which now we are uh, showing to you. And uh, we can uh, show the areas, um, the areas of the toolkit. And these areas are uh, uh, seven. The one is about uh, presenting the key concepts and ideas of the multi-level uh, governance and how they apply to VET. Uh, this is what I briefly introduced uh, uh, in my presentation. The number two is about a method for um, building vision in a participatory, in a participatory manner. Mm -hmm. The area four is about financing very important. What about the costing, budgeting, financing and funding of skills policy or vocational education and training? The area five is about social partnership. So the cooperation between public and private. The area six is about territorial governance. So what happens or what should and may happen um, at territorial uh, at territorial level. And the area seven is about uh, the monitoring. It's very important to take stock at milestones, where we are, what have we achieved, uh, um, and are we on track uh, in attaining, uh, in attaining the, uh, our, the policy goals set in our policy agenda. So we have seven areas. Hmm? Um, now, what do you find or what do we find 
in these uh, um, in these seven areas. In each of the uh, area, Erica, we can show the menu. So we have a menu on the right side, um, and if we click in each of let's the, the let me connect her. In each of the area, there is someone uh, talking. In each of the area, we see that two, um, say, sub areas. One is methodology and the other is in practice. Now we have uh, highlighted the area three institutional arrangements. This is where my colleague Manuel will go more into uh, specific uh, examples when we'll uh, divide in breakout rooms. So I'm not elaborating. Uh, what I want to say at the moment is that uh, under these institutional arrangement areas in methodology, we can click on methodology, we find, uh, uh, go down, scroll down, a guide for the review of institutional um, uh, arrangement. Um, so uh, this is a uh, um, so if you want, you click on it. And the idea of the toolkit is really to provide with tools. So all these tools are usable. Um, each country can uh, apply, read through and uh, apply the methodology, which is uh, uh, suggested in the, in, the, um, in the guides that we provide. It, the country can ask uh, the advice of, of uh, ETF. Um, and the country can work with other countries in pairs, in twinning, and so on. So this, in the methodology, is what you find is really an approach to guide you on how to review institutional arrangement. You remember this is the first stage, uh, which is always, always uh, uh, very crucial to see who are the actors, what are they doing, what is the mandate of the various uh, institutions and how these various uh, institutions coordinate together. And in the section in practice, you will find a concrete example of the work carried out by the ETF uh, uh, in several countries. Um, the other area perhaps I want to now click on is area five, social partnership. Uh, this is the, uh, the area where I will go a little bit more into with your help when we'll uh, divide, uh, when we will divide in, uh, uh, in the breakout uh, rooms. Again, you find uh, in the area social partnership uh, a section with methodologies. We can click on methodology and just to give a, a methodology and just uh, we'll see from the menu that under methodology, we have a position paper of the ETF uh, on social dialogue and social partnership. Uh, we have uh, uh, the work done on government and social partner cooperation where we had identified that some of you did participate in this conference uh, a couple of years ago, actually I'm very happy to see you uh, here with, with us, where we identify 10, 10 steps on 10 milestones uh, that are very important uh, in order to develop uh, not only the dialogue, but concrete and operational uh, uh, partnership, and so on and so forth. Again, on the social partnership, you you find a section in practice where uh, there are examples uh, of uh, country work. I only want to mention now, because I'm uh, closing, that under Area 5, uh, there is also a new, more recent section dedicated to civil society organizations. Uh, and I think that more and more, uh, as we move uh, towards the implementation of lifelong learning policies, it is uh, of utmost importance to recognize the role of civil society organizations. So they reach out uh, uh, groups of people that are not necessarily in the formal system. Maybe they have difficulty to access the, for the, <laughs> the formal system. But in essence, civil society organizations are part of the uh, policy system. And it is very important uh, as a first move uh, to um, award a recognition to this organization that they are part of the system. They are not outside, they are in. The question is governance. Okay, how do we involve them and how we, uh, we collect their, 
voice. Um, thank you very much. I stop here because I think it's more important at this stage, uh, perhaps uh, to, to hear and collect some of the questions. And therefore, back to you, Simona. Thank you all. Voila, now you, I I'm sure you can hear me. Thank you so much, uh, Syria. Um, before moving to the question and answer session, just a quick information for those following us on the streaming. In case you wish to take a part to the full program of the day, you have a section which is called comment and where, where you will find the link to register. So just in case you want to follow the full day. I think that actually, Whatever there is a question in the chat, and I will try to, to look for it. In any case, I'm sure you found in the chat at the beginning already some questions. Where do they come from? Those questions actually were brought forward from you at the registration <laughs> form level, which means that we will now collect what, what are, let's call it the immediate question. And then uh, we will also have a look at those. No question will be lost in space. If some question will, uh, will remain unanswered, today there we will there will still be possibility to go through open space and to keep this dialogue open i think we have a, a what we call under the category immediate question one question from uh, mr hamouti uh, who is talking about the challenge of the multi-stakeholder approach which means two having around the table people who understand that i couldn't agree more personally at least to second point people who are committed third point absence of an independent agency for for evaluation which i think is a reality in some of our countries uh, i don't know if syria or manuel would make uh, a comment regarding those three challenges highlighted of mr hamouti you are muted yeah okay uh, comment. Um, you highlight uh, a, a, a very important condition, but at the same time, uh, this is an area um, which calls for, for action and work. Um, it is important to have uh, around the table in the conversation on the, on the policy and uh, governance processes, uh, um, actors that are aware and that know the system uh, very well from inside. This cannot be more, more true. It requires uh, uh, an investment where these, uh, say, deep understanding or knowledge from inside, uh, not necessarily available or so spread, uh, it identifies an area for action. Uh, it's, uh, it requires some time, but uh, uh, it's very important that all the parties uh, take on their responsibility. And if we speak about the social partners, the private sector, when entering into a dialogue with the government, they have to acquire and increase their knowledge and understanding of how the VET system works. And they also have to uh, develop an awareness, I would say, not only technical knowledge, but also an awareness uh, about the fact that they do play a role. They are not outside the system. They are part of the system. And in order to play their responsibility, uh, they have to um, um, agree that they take on their shoulders part of the responsibility. So I would say it's a mix of capacity uh, is a mix also of uh, um, self-awareness and development of understanding. And it takes time, but it's worth doing. I don't know if Manuel wants to add something. Okay. Uh, okay, Manuel has nothing to add. Actually, um, I have a question for Manuel, because despite that no, we don't have any question under the immediate category, um, Manuel, we had a question which was actually copied at the beginning of the chat, which, as I said earlier, came from the registration 
platform, which was how to enhance a social partner involvement in designing and implementing vet reform following the adoption of the Osnabrück Declaration. Mamma mia, what a difficult name. Uh, Manuel, do you have any immediate reaction since actually social partnership is also uh, Syria highlighted uh, is more your area? Uh, in case, because Manuel is the only one which is not who is not in our room, in case he has uh, some technical problem, we can double check Syria. I'm really sorry, I have to jump on you again and can i ask you to reply to this question about the involvement of social partner in designing and implementing vet reforms following the adoption of the osnabrück declaration so the question is about the how if you have something on the what it would be more than welcome of course yeah this is a <laughs> this is a question of agnes and thank you it's a, a one million uh, dollar but it is very uh, very important and i i want to thank uh, agnes for uh, for raising this issue uh, it is true that the osnabrück declaration uh, has raised the level of the ambition but it's also raised the level of the challenge the Osnabrück Declaration, and if we look also at the uh, lifelong uh, learning of skills agenda, uh, has set uh, um, high indicators, high target for participation of people, young people, uh, less young, uh, adult people, people in the labor market, people outside the labor market uh, to participate in uh, uh, skills development opportunities in lifelong learning. Um, and by raising the ambition of these uh, targets and number of people who have to participate, uh, of course, uh, uh, it requires, uh, it imposes to system an additional effort. And when I say systems, I, I think it's clear now, I mean both the governmental agencies as well as uh, the private sector, the social partners, uh, including individual uh, enterprises and non-governmental organization of, of civil society. So how to, um, uh, it, is, it is a target of the Osnabrück Declaration uh, really to um, have uh, a much more cohesive uh, decision making and implementation procedures in order to allow such a, a change in the scale, such a change in magnitude of ma many more people uh, attending uh, learning opportunities on a regular basis. So how to um, uh, reach this new level, uh, it definitely requires a, a much stronger uh, uh, cooperation. It requires a, a more uh, a clear and uh, institutionalized mechanism for collaboration at all levels. Mm? Let's not forget about the multi-level. So it's a national level, it, but it also should happen at sub-national level, regionally or locally, uh, that the partners of all sides have the common vision, have the common vision, as we said, and they work for the same goal. But it also, imposes a new level of uh, responsibility and a new level of commitment, I would say, in order for uh, more people uh, in learning to happen. Uh, so thank you for raising. Uh, uh, it's a new challenge and therefore it's a moment to, re to revise and to review and to improve the governance because uh, uh, the scale of the challenge is really the moment where you have to see whether the governance arrangements are effectively functioning or you need the new ones. Okay, thank you so much. So we have actually uh, three more minutes before moving to the other part of, uh, of our uh, one and a half hour together. So before uh, moving to that part, I think I would like to, to make a revenge of my colleague and building upon a question which has been brought forward by you as participants, which is the one million dollar question. How can countries modernize that governance? As we say in Italian, mamma mia. I'm not sure there is an answer. There are for sure different approaches and perspectives. But uh, Siria Manuel, would you have any immediate reaction on top of my Mamma Mia that would conclude this part? So how can we modernize? Is there any recipe to cook that we can share with our participants? Uh, um, recipe, uh, yes, there are many, many recipes, but there are more challenges than, than, uh, than recipes, actually. 
um, the most important approach, I would say the, the first step, uh, it's really what we have called the review stages. Are we uh, tuned? Uh, are we tuned onto what are the um, policy objectives and target we set for ourselves? Mm. Let's review how do we function uh, now. This is the first important thing. And the second is really to deploy a project or an action plan. Don't think that governance is something ab abstract. Governance is very concrete, is made of uh, people interaction, is made of institutions, is made of processes. And we can change the processes. We can improve the processes. But we have to agree what is the change uh, we want. And we have to agree on an action plan. And all the parties involved, they have to contribute and participate and have an agreed role uh, and responsibility into the change process. This is also how we have designed the toolkit. You can take it as a guide to a change process with various steps from vision building to institutional arrangement, to financing, to social partnership. Take the toolkit, this is our advice, um, as a guide to a change process. Make it like a project. Give yourself milestones, identify responsibilities, and monitor the progress. And this can be done. Okay, so how to say, thank you so much. So it was a $1 million question. So I think she would deserve $2 million for the answer, which I think was really to the point. We have in the meantime, some comments from Georgia about actually the maturity of, for example, countries that are facing young democracies. And also we have other comment on the vertical horizontal dimension of governance. Uh, actually, I think those comments are super important. As I said at the beginning, the story doesn't end here. You know, as we work in ETF, there is always second part, which is our open space. So to be continued in open space, as well as the other question which were in the chat and brought forward from you. So what we would do now, I would say goodbye to all the people that are following us on streaming, since uh, actually, unless they have registered in the meantime, we will now move to the breakout room. So goodbye to everyone in streaming. Thank you for being with us. And actually what is happening now, uh, you will be redirected automatically. You don't have to do anything apart one click to two different breakout rooms. You will have a pop-up coming on your screen. You have just to click on join the breakout rooms and that's it. Breakout rooms are allocated randomly. So I don't see your faces. Keep your camera on because I want to see how much you are desperate or excited about actually going in the breakout room. So I see people are smiling. So at least we have some, someone alive around the table, which is good for the online modality. Having said that, we have two breakout room. Number one, you will talk about, we will talk actually about public-private partnership study. And this will be with Syria. And room number two, Manuel, please, is, um, actually switch on your camera. We will talk about the Moldova case. Moldova case, uh, uh, Moldova had a very good experience on review of institutional arrangement. It is actually a fruitful and recent experience and we will talk about that. Breakout room, Syria. Breakout room to Manuel. I think we can launch the breakout rooms. You will have a 20 minutes. And when you come back, it's a mass switch on the camera because for the closing remarks and the final fireworks, I would like to see you all in face. So now you go to the breakout room. Thank you so much. I'm waiting for you in plenary. Some of you I might see back in the breakout room. Thank you, please, Erica.
thank you. <laughs> Okay. Eccoci, tam -tam. welcome back in plenary. Actually, I wanted to ring my bell because I wanted to ring the bell on Syria, but Syria, she was on time with her presentation and she didn't give me the opportunity to ring the bell. So I wanted to do it. So now I did it. Okay, I feel satisfied. So uh, just to continue revitalizing your energy towards the end of this one and a half hour together, please go in your chat again, in the chat, not in your, in the chat again, click on the link and as before, you will be redirected to Mentimeter, uh, which is actually just a, a tool in order to share with you a poll, a series of questions. So. Go in the chat, click on the link, be Mentimeter, and please reply. Two people already reply. Unfortunately, there is no prize for the first reply, but we can think something uh, like that for next event, actually. So the question is, do state and non-state actors cooperate in the governance of VAT in your country? So to make a long story short, who does what? <laughs> Dunque, go in the chat, click on the link, be a Mentimeter, reply to the question. I know you are many more. Uh, also, sometimes uh, also internet connection might slow down a bit the process of moving from the Zoom platform to the Mentimeter. So the question is, who does what? And I see that actually state and non-state actors cooperate in the governance of that in your country to some extent. Okay, this is what we call an answer at the Italian way. Uh, so, so and so. Second question, and I'm basically ready to pass the floor for a few more remarks from Manuel. Do you think the governance of that is important for system change? Ecco, bravi. You gave us satisfaction because you said yes, 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 yes. So yes, in fact, it is actually without the governance process, basically, I don't think how social dialogue can be in place, but I'm not the expert today here. Also, I'm not in the field, by the way. So Manuel, is there anything that you would like to add at this, uh, at this actually very end of the session before we, we conclude? So we see actually here a final screen and where I think uh, Manuel can comment on it, which is the priority for the ETF in the VET governance next year. Over to you, Manuel. Please, Manuel, be very close to the microphone. We might miss your face and we will appreciate your hair, but I think the sound will benefit from it. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Simona. Thank you, colleagues. I hope you listen to me now a little bit better than in the working groups because we, we put something um, close to my mouth. Um, well, um, first, uh, I want to thank uh, everyone participating today in this session for us. After 10 years that we started to develop the multi-level governance approach for the ATF, um, I think first in these 10 years, we managed um, that our ATF partner countries basically move it from new practices and new approaches and new poli policy thinking about, let's say, uh, moving from very centralized approach or highly centralized approach, governmental driven, at least to have the perception and to have also the, um, let's say, the, the, the practical way of uh, doing business, integrating more voices in the policy making process, integrating, trying to integrate the right partners for doing it, uh, despite still, for example, uh, the issue of social partnership in our partner countries is challenging in terms of um, uh, equal representation of, uh, for example, employers, organizations and unions. But in this case, we also presented today a concept of public-private partnership, which seems, which seems uh, to be much more accepted or, or implementable by our partner countries. We were discussing at the beginning about uh, our theoretical approaches that we shared many years ago, uh, ago and also uh, Syria jumped to some practicalities on implementation of this concept. 
we move to to have in this first session um, uh, the discussion on public private partnership and institutional arrangements why we did this first because this is the first session online session that we are that we are sharing with you we want to move to other sessions hopefully one day we will do face, face to face also but i think the also online online mode for for this uh, working session is a uh, fantastic uh, opportunity for doing so i see in the screen a lot of uh, topics and uh, and, uh, and um, issues that um, are really uh, bringing our attention from many years ago could be decentralization, could be financing, could be dual bed, or also which uh, is also let's say could be seen from a, a clear uh, public-private partnership arrangement. So. Um, there are things to, to do next. It's, a, it's also autonomy of schools, which is also an issue uh, related also with the decentralization, which is um, for us uh, also an, um, an, an important issue. And we try also to um, feed the toolbox to, um, to the policy thinking in the countries on how to, let's say, uh, devolve more power to, to other uh, layers in the systems. So all these issues are for us important this session today was to discuss with you for the first time on this but also what to do next um, and it's clear that uh, what you propose on what to do next is also um, uh, in agreement with us and we are agree with your uh, proposals on what to do next according to the screen thank you Manuel, you ended here. You want me to pass the floor? You are passing me the floor? I, I think you were asking me to pass me the floor. <laughs> no, no, no. I was just smiling. You no, know, from my, from my when side. When Italians smile, it looks like they talk. Okay. That no, was from a my side, From my side, I was, I was trying to conclude by saying that uh, what I saw in the screen on what to do next, we, we, get, we pick up these opinions and are much are very much in, in line with what we want to, to move next. So I think, according to your opinions, um, um, we are moving in this, in this right side on, on, on exploring these, these things with partner countries centralization, uh, autonomy, uh, public-private partnership, uh, etc. So uh, from my side, it's is, is almost all. So um, uh, I, would, I would like to have more time in, in practical to, to work on uh, more issues. But I think for, for the first session, uh, we are very thankful to you. And, uh, and we had a, 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 good, a good session, I think, uh, not too, too many time, but uh, but thank you, Simona. I pass the floor to you now officially. <laughs> okay, thank you for the officially passing of the floor. Official, actually, not officially. Syria. Uh, uh, few words. Uh, we have some. Oh, okay, Laura. First of all, while Syria, she's trying to unmute in her because they have to tell you today behind the scene, we had so many IT technical problems that you would never imagine all, everything together. So this is actually the beauty and the beast of the online events. So while we are trying to make the mouse working because we are at the level, not even the connection, we are at the level of problems with mouse. Syria governance in two free and then we conclude in time. Over to you. Uh, governance is about action. And what we want to call you and us together is to act on governance because the processes and the institutions and the cooperation, it is so important to uh, bring the reforms uh, forward. We have the challenge now to transform uh, the systems from uh, vocational education uh, only, which was already a lot, onto extended lifelong learning. Um, and this requires uh, action and it requires cooperation, it requires cooperation. I would like also to um, draw your attention to some of the comments in the chat uh, 
from my colleague Marie on transparency, absolutely important, uh, from uh, uh, Christian Wells about uh, both the horizontal and vertical uh, dimension, uh, from, uh, from Cidita, um, from Georgia, about uh, bringing the actors uh, uh, together. This is about action. Uh, uh, it's about assessment, reflection, but it's about doing, and this is how I want to conclude today. Okay, thank you so much to all of you. In case you, you would wish to switch on the camera, this is exactly the right and the last moment actually to do it. <laughs> Allow me to thank uh, uh, all the participants, uh, all the priorities that actually you have set up for ETF work. Okay, you want to make us work until the 2030, I'm afraid. But uh, as I said at the beginning, the story doesn't end here. The to be continued will be through open space. All the priorities you have identified all your comments all your input will be actually taken fully on board by the team by Siri and Manuel and I promise because they are hard worker both so please uh, go on the open space on the dedicated event page where also you will find all the slide actually the link to open space in case you are still guessing well, what is this open space they are talking about for one and a half hour voila you have the link in the chat so no more question about open space click on the link Link, register and be part of our wonderful community also once you are in open space you will have the toolkit at your disposal you see there are many parts of the toolkit practice methodology so we really try to kind of make a, a good compromise between what we still need to learn about governance and the how the what and the how are there waiting for you uh, can i also call just next to me and i put my wonderful animalier mask also erica and anna just to say just to say hello and goodbye, actually, actually they are saying hello because they are joining us for the first time and they say goodbye. So thank you so much. Uh, we tried to be on time until the very end. These are the dream team. This is the girls. <laughs> Here you have it, uh, Manuel. I'm sorry and All my right. deep apologies from, from the Evans team for whatever problem happened to the IT. Microphone was perfectly functioning before the meeting and then it was not. So that's life. Thank you so much. See you next time. And actually, it can sound like a threat, but you will hear from us. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank bye, you. Bye. 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 Bye.